Science Public Online Talk Series, SPOT, brought to you by the Faculty of Science at the University of Manitoba. My name is Samar Safi Harp, Physics and Astronomy Professor and Faculty of Science Lead for Equity, Diversity and Community. And I'm very thrilled to be moderating today's talk by Dr. Jim Peebles, our keynote SPOT speaker. He's Albert Einstein Professor of Science Emeritus at Princeton University. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge first that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Big thanks to the Faculty of Science support team for working behind the scenes and making this series possible. Also, special thanks to all of our speakers for generously offering their time and expertise during these unprecedented times and for making the series accessible to all. Some housekeeping items. The talk will be 20 minutes long, followed by a question answer period also about 20 minutes long. To ask your questions, you're gonna have to go to slido.com and enter the event code 1366. If you encounter any difficulties, please send an email to andrewpopil at humanitoba.ca. The email is shown on the slide. Feel free to enter your question throughout the talk. You could choose to uh, indicate your name or remain anonymous, and I'll be reading the questions to the speaker. Now, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Jim Peebles. Dr. Peebles is originally from Winnipeg, and he did his undergraduate at the University of Manitoba. He tells me that he started out in engineering, which taught him a lot, but since he was running out of physics courses, he transferred to the physics department, where he found his natural home. Now, late professor of physics, Ken Standing, advised him to go to Princeton University in New Jersey for his graduate studies. This is where he found Professor Robert Henry Dickey's Gravity Research Group. Professor Dickey was his advisor for his doctoral dissertation and remained his professor of continuing education. Dr. Peebles had been at, has been at Princeton University since he rose through the ranks at Princeton to his present position, Albert Einstein Professor of Science Emeritus. Retired now for 20 years, he continues to work on the physics he loves, that is addressing one of the most fundamental questions in nature about our universe, how it came to be and how it evolves. Dr. Peebles received many awards and recognitions throughout his career, and very excitingly, last year, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his significant contributions to our understanding of the universe, the evolution of the universe, and for his theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology. Dr. Peebles is surely one of a kind. Aside from this Nobel recognition, he's also a very kind, generous, and very modest person. Dr. Peebles will share with us lessons learned on the nature of physical science from the study of the expanding universe. Dr. Peebles, we're very thrilled to have you join us. Welcome and over to you. Thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure to join this, this sequence of lectures. Um, and you know, I, I owe a lot to the University of Manitoba. They taught me what I love to do, physics. They showed me a lot about how to do it and then sent me off to Princeton. Couldn't have been a better start to my career. Uh, today, I want to talk about the science wars. You may, some of you may remember. Is our physical science a true good approximation to an objective reality? Or is it uh, an invention made up and imposed on us by a cabal of old boys, as some sociologists would have it, or is it somewhere in between, as some sociologists would have it? 
I didn't pay much attention to this war when it was fought, but I've come to see that sociologists occupy an important position. They stand back a little from what we're doing in physical science and can see things that aren't so apparent to us as we're deep into the activity. I offer as an example this book by Lev Landau and Eugenie Lifshitz, named The Classical Theory of Field. This is a 1951 English translation of the 1948 second edition of the 1941 book. You pause to consider between 41 and 48, an awful lot happened in Russia, including a dreadful war with Germany. This is part of a series of books on theoretical physics. The, the corpus of knowledge you ought to be able to grasp if you want to become a member of this team of physicists. They don't, Lando and Lipschitz don't explain why the laws of physics are said to be what they are, they're just presented. This book presents the theory of electromagnetism, the classical theory. No explanation of why the theory is what it is. They don't mention that the theory has passed an abundance of tests in the laboratory. And I think even more important, an immense number of tests in practical application. You consider those immense hydroelectric powers, power plants in Manitoba, the transmission lines that carry electric and magnetic fields that carry energy to your home to do all kinds of things down to the tiny electric and magnetic fields that push electrons around inside your cell phone and distort crystals to do your bidding. I cannot demonstrate, no one can demonstrate that there is not some other theory invented by some other culture that would give us its services by some other very different way. But it seems wildly improbable in short, I'm not, I don't hesitate to say that we have a spectacularly strong case that electromagnetism is a very good and useful approximation to reality. Two thirds of this book are devoted to electromagnetism. The last third to Einstein's new theory of gravitation, general relativity. Van der Lewis don't mention that this theory at that time had next to zero empirical support. The one successful test it passed was that it could account for the measured orbit of the planet Mercury, which, which the old theory of gravity, Newtonian mechanics, couldn't do. That was impressive, a real accomplishment. But on the other hand, in those days, you could equally well account for the orbit of Mercury by postulating the presence of another planet inside the orbit of Mercury. Uh, it even had a name, Vulcan. With Vulcan, you don't need general relativity. In short, you can do without it. Why then was this theory placed in the book of what a physics student should learn? An historian could, uh, a sociologist could say, Einstein just made up this theory. And uh, the old boy network, put it into the theory you ought to learn. A physicist would say that it's not quite that bad. Uh, the transition from electromagnetism to general relativity theory works wonderfully well in this book. Uh, you're working throughout the electromagnetism with the, with the line element of Minkowski describing flat space time. The chapter begins, let's imagine that the line element becomes a general function of position and away you go. It's a beautiful continuation of the methods of classical field theory. Uh, some physicists would go so far as to say that this is a theory that was made in, waiting to be discovered. It was there waiting to be discovered. I don't really like that notion. I don't know what, quite what it means to be there, but to be discovered. But certainly, it's an elegant theory. But yet, uh, this, the sociologist is right. We made it up. The situation has changed, of course. Now, the theory of general relativity is applied in global positioning systems to get the right timing. 
of the satellites that can pinpoint where you are. Satellites have been sent through the solar system. Their motions carefully, precisely followed. Their motions consisted with general relativity theory. That's on big scales, um, 10 to the 13, 10 followed by 13 zeros centimeters. Detection of gravitational waves, some merging neutron stars out at around 10 to the 26 centimeters. 10 was one followed by 26 zeros. And it's applied to the large scale structure of the universe very successfully passing demanding tests on scales 10 to the 28 centimeters, spectacular. So we learned a lesson. I forgot to turn on the timer. No, oh, never mind. Ideas of elegance can lead us to theories that are so well tested that they convince us that this surely is a good approximation to reality. Never the final theory, you must understand, all of our physics is approximate. That is to say, it fails if applied to the wrong sorts of experiments. But it's all wonderfully productive, and that now includes general relativity theory. Of course, elegance can lead us quite astray. Um, I'll mention later uh, the steady state cosmology of Fred Hoyle, a beautiful theory, but wrong. Also, intuition can be very, very confusing. Einstein introduced the notion of a cosmological constant because that's the only way he could make his theory consistent with his notion that the universe is static, unchanging. When he discovered the evidence that the universe is not static, expanding, he renounced the, his cosmological constant. He had a wonderful statement to um, Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian physicist and a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, Lemaitre, I think in the 1930s, understood Einstein's general relativity theory better than anyone else, including Einstein. Late 1947, a letter from Einstein to Georges Lemaitre. Lemaitre had been pushing on Einstein the thought that there is, this cosmological constant isn't all bad. But Einstein's reply, which I just love, I cannot help to feel it strongly, and I am unable to believe that such an ugly thing should be realized in nature. When I was a graduate student, the eminent authorities, people like uh, Wolfgang Pauli, like Landau and Lichitz, quite agreed, away with the cosmological constant. I remember well in the 1980s when I was seeing a lot of evidence that we'd better put the cosmological constant back, having to listen to careful explanations by my theoretical colleagues saying that this constant is an abomination, it's surely not there. But yet it's there, lots of evidence now. Things are get complicated. So I want to, um, one lesson then. Sociologists are right, we make up a lot of physics, but yet we can develop tests and some of those made up stories turn out to be wonderfully good approximations to nature. I have a second um, example to show you. Perhaps those of you uh, who do physics and similar physical sciences uh, have noticed that when a new idea appears, the odds are pretty good that someone has already had that idea and people didn't notice, or maybe that at about the same time, someone else was having the very same idea. I, I, I saw this happening when I was a graduate student. I've seen it happen many times since then. And during that time, have never made anything of it, except that that's the way it goes. Until I started writing a history of what has been happening in cosmology in the 100 years since Einstein started us on the right track, it's in this book, Physical Cosmology, available in a bookstore near you, or maybe on the web, uh, that forced me to see how often it happens that we have these multiple discoveries. Um, sociologists are quite familiar with this. Here, you see the date, 1922. It is an interesting phenomenon that many inventions have been made two or more times by different inventors. 
each working without knowledge of the other's research. These authors list 148 such cases. They, they range broadly, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, physics, medicine, biology, psychology, and practical mechanics. Wow. Another sociologist, Robert Merton, gave this phenomenon a title, Singletons and Multiples in Scientific Discovery, 1961. When I started noticing this, these multiple discoveries, uh, I started looking around asking myself, someone, surely someone has commented on this. I can't find any discussion of it in the literature by physical scientists. We all seem to just take it as the way it is. It was sociologists who told us this is a phenomenon and worth considering. Now I showed you an example, which I have to introduce, by speaking of what happened at the end of Second World War. It, un it unleashed an immense amount of energy into science and technology. Things ranging from fins on cars to particle accelerators. These four people independently started working on the subject of cosmology not long after the war. Bob Dickey on the far left, who was my teacher, worked on war research at the MIT Radiation Laboratory on radar and such electronic devices. Yakov Zeldovich on the right worked on war research in the Soviet Union. He was a main contributor to nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union. George Gamov, second from my left, far left, was Ukrainian, absconded to the England and then the United States. Uh, had the deepest in physical intuition of anyone I've run across. Just a spectacular imagination and intuition. The last goes with that an indifference to details. In 1948, he introduced a wonderful idea that the universe expanded from a hot, dense state. That expansion would give us two things, two remnant fossils. One is a sea of thermal radiation left over from that hot early universe cooled as the universe expands, but still filling space. And second, it would make a lot of helium, the second lightest element. Those were published in 1948. Alas, they more or less fell out of sight because Gamma moved to other things. Fred Hoyle, in the same year, 1948, was one of three people, with Herman Bondi and uh, Tommy Gold, decided on a new cosmology, a steady state cosmology. Let the universe be expanding. Let there be a continual creation of matter that collects and forms into new galaxies that replace the old ones that are moving apart. I didn't know Fred Hoyle all that well, but I got the clear impression that he was convinced that the scales of cosmology are just so immense that you'll never be able to establish an empirical cosmology. It must be established by philosophy. And I must say, the steady state cosmology is philosophically gorgeous. He could never, alas, uh, bring himself to accept that we were establishing an empirically based cosmology. Uh, now I come to the year 1964, where a lot was happening on this notion of a hot Big Bang. On the left, Fred Hoyle in Cambridge, England, had by this time become quite aware that the oldest stars have a lot of helium, more by far than you could imagine being formed in stars. Where in the world would that helium have come from? Fred intensely disliked Gamow's hot big bang, but Fred is a good scientist. He wrote a paper with Roger Taylor pointing out that the title of the paper was the mystery of the cosmic helium abundance. And they acknowledged that Gamow's theory might be the explanation. Second from the right left, here is a photograph of, of Yakov Zeldovich in the Soviet Union. You understand that he had great influence in the Soviet Union because of his work on the nuclear bomb. He was a four time awarded the Worker Social Hero Medal. I am told that when he needed something from the bureaucracy, he would put on his medals and command instant attention. 
But of course, he knew secrets that the Soviet uh, bureaucracy didn't want known. He could not leave the Soviet Union. His communications with the outside world hampered by bureaucracy that censored mail going in and mail going out. Yet he, along with these two excellent scientists in the Soviet Union, did some great science. He knew Gamow's theory, but uh, Zeldovich felt that the abundance of helium is low, and so Gamow's theory must be wrong. He couldn't check with astronomers who knew the real situation that helium is very abundant. Next to him uh, shows a telescope and two young people, Bob Wilson on the left, Arno Penzias on the right, uh, who are part of experiments in microwave communication at the Bell Telephone Laboratories in upstate New Jersey. That research led to well, cell phones and the, to me, horrible sight of students walking our campus staring at the cell phones instead of where they're going. The experiments uh, revealed a problem. It, the rate receivers were detecting too much noise, radi radiation noise. These two spent a lot of dogged time trying to track down the safe source of that noise. They had just about reached the tether of their imagination when they uh, heard of an activity down in Princeton, New Jersey. My teacher, Bob Dickey, had decided for thinking quite on his own, very different reasons, that a hot Big Bang is a good idea. And if the early universe were hot, there ought to be thermal radiation left over, and it ought to be detectable. He suggested to two of his young postdocs that they build a Dickey radiometer to look for this radiation. Here you see David Wilkinson holding a screwdriver. Peter Roll is hidden behind there. He has a plaid shirt on. And here is a device Bob invented during World War II, a device capable of sensitive detection of radiation at centimeter, millimeter wavelengths that might be left over from a hot early universe. Here was the situation in uh, 1964. I should have mentioned that the astronomers had another anomaly. In interstellar space, there are molecules, including cyanogen, a carbon stuck to nitrogen. The presence of that molecule is observed by the absorption it causes to starlight passing through clouds of cyanogen. The absorption was observed not only in the ground level of cyanogen, but in the first excited level. That was a mystery. Why was cyanogen in cold, dead, empty interstellar space excited to the first excited level? It was acknowledged that it could be because there's radiation exciting it. Fred Hoyle knew about that in the 1950s. I can cite two papers in which he discusses it. Yet in 1964, when he is fretting about helium, he had forgotten that. You see this wonderful set of possible set of people, each of whom had a bit of the story in their grasp. It wasn't until someone told Arno Penzias that he ought to call Bob Dickey that the whole piece came together. And in the early 1950s, we learned that uh, all of this fit together into a hot big bang. Stop sharing. Hi, huh? Am I back? Oh, good. So here is the situation. We physicists tend not to be all that communicative, but we do talk to each other, sometimes explicitly. We go to conferences, we exchange correspondence, now email. And somehow we exchange ideas. This example shows something that is very common in, in, in physical science. Although we don't often verbalize what we're doing, we do send signals, I think sometimes inadvertent by what you say and what you don't say, that can lead us to new ideas that can lead us to aspects of reality. In particular, that thermal radiation is convincing evidence 
because it couldn't have been convinced, produced in the universe as it is now, that our universe has expanded from a hot, dense state. We arrived at it by that concat concat concatenation of, of different research activities in that one year, 1964. So let me stop there, and I hope we can move on to some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Peebles. Perfect timing. We already have many questions. So, um, so and people can actually vote on the questions if you want to see some uh, being answered uh, first, but I'm going to start with the questions uh, we see. Uh, there are a few questions on giving advice to different stages. So um, the first one I see is what advice, um, oh, sorry. So a uh, question from Mason, what advice would you give to a fellow Manitoban about to start their first faculty position in the United States? Well, work hard at it. Um, what worked for me so wonderfully well, find something that really interests you. And I guess Nathan has found that. Second, work really hard at it. Good things will come of it. Um, universities in the US are like universities in Canada or Europe. Uh, they're competitive, but uh, and, and certainly you will pay close attention to teaching. That's important in, in whatever university you attend. And uh, work hard on what really interests you. Great. Thank we should you. be a little careful, you know, these days you have not only to work on what interests you, but on what interests your, your mentors people higher up in the campus, in, in the department, in the university. I never paid much attention to that. Instead, I just stuck my nose in my research and things worked out pretty well. I, I, I wish you all the best, Nathan. Yeah, and congratulations, Mason. Uh, the next question from Sobi. Congratulations on the Nobel Prize. Do you think we will know why our observable universe started with low entropy? And is that a must for the arrow of time? Uh, certainly an arrow of time is an operation. We are evolving and the direction is unambiguous. Um, when I say that we have a well-tested theory of the expanding universe, it is of what happened as the universe expanded and cooled. One can ask the question, what was the universe like doing before it was expanding? There are ideas. Uh, there is very little empirical evidence, and so there's lots of debate. Uh, it is striking that the universe started out with low entropy, depending on how you define entropy. But what is very striking is the universe started out very close to absolutely homogeneous, with only tiny departures from homogeneity, and the homogene inhomogeneity has grown. Very well-tested theory, it happened. Uh, but why? Well, that's to be discovered. Thank you. A uh, question from Adam and Latifa. Do you have any advice for young students on how to be successful and how to contribute to knowledge when we are older? These are 11 and 13 year old kids. Okay, well, uh, keep your minds open. Look around you at what interests you. Look into what interests you. You, might, you may find that you're fascinated by some things, not so interested in others. Focus on what interests you. Um, look at it from various directions, read a few books, think about it. Maybe you'll find that some particular aspect of what interests you is really interesting, or perhaps you'll be led in your reading to some other topic entirely. Keep an open mind, both consider what interests you and look around at neighboring things. The world is full, you know, of all kinds of fascinating things. Enjoy them all and look at what particularly interests you with particular care. Thank you. Well said. Uh, next question from John. Hi, what are the next steps in cosmology? 
how might future scientists continue making discoveries and develop theories about the development of the universe? Uh, I must admit that during my career, I was picking low-hanging fruit. Much of that has now been picked. Uh, the problems are getting harder in cosmology, the research groups growing much larger. Uh, you understand that most of my research papers are one or two, are one author, a few, two or three authors. I've never written a paper, well, with one exception, with more than four or five authors. The latest satellite measurements of the radiation had a thousand authors. Just a different ballgame. That is one approach to cosmology is ever more careful and detailed measurements and it's happening. Another approach is to start looking at the odds and ends that people have been neglecting. I'm particularly fascinated these days with the question of how galaxies form. There are good ideas that are carefully investigated, but it seems to me that people haven't stood back and asked themselves, do, do these ideas really make full sense? I'm fascinated by the thought that maybe they don't and that maybe I can have a little something to offer on how to make a little better sense of how galaxies form. It's always this decision you have to make, you know, between joining a large group and being part of a cog and a vast set of cogs. I don't mean to depreciate that, but to me it's a little bit alien. Strike out on your own, and you'd better be careful. You may find yourself isolated and spinning your own wheel. But um, try to strike a balance. Uh, I certainly have. Work in groups, work independently. I don't know how much more there is to discover in cosmology, but I can tell you my experience. I've been working in the subject for more than half a century. and. Time and again, I have been startled by what can be done in this subject to test my theories, time and again. I don't imagine I've, I will miss being excited, startled once again. Thank you. Uh, next question, has your perspective on science changed since your undergrad days? Well, yes. At first, I... I, I <clears throat> I learned that I love physics at the University of Manitoba. While there, and as I was a graduate student, I thought of physics as, some, as, as a mathematical game. I didn't pay a lot of attention to phenomenology. As time went on, I became more and more impressed by the fact that theory without the support of phenomenology can be empty. So certainly my perspective has grown to be a deeper and deeper respect for the importance of the interaction of theory and observation, theory and practice. Great. Uh, next question from Veronica. Thank you for this presentation. When will the universe stop expanding and what will the consequences of this be? So Veronica, we don't know whether the universe will stop expanding. Um, there is talk. Uh, that if you accept the present standard theory, uh, the universe will expand indefinitely into the indefinitely remote future, becoming more and more empty, uh, the galaxies becoming well separated, each galaxy slowly contracting to a black hole that evaporates, a dismal end to it all. We don't know that that'll happen. Um, the nice thing about studying the past of the universe is that we can find fossils to interpret and show us good evidence for what happened. Can't find fossils from the future. And so the exploration of what will happen is a lot more loose, a lot more uncertain. Not to my taste. So who knows what will happen. My bet is it'll be interesting. Thank you. Uh, next question from Melvin. How did we, uh, i.e. our solar system, physically get into our present position to receive the light from galaxies from the time near the Big Bang? Now, wait. We are in a, in a galaxy, as you say, in a, in a solar system uh, that is suitable for our being. 
Um, there are lots of other galaxies, and our present theory, which is very well tested, is if you were in another galaxy, you'd say the same thing we do. Remember uh, that our universe is not an isolated, is, is, is not an island. The universe is everywhere, uniformly filled with galaxies. Go to another galaxy, you can't do it, but if you were in another galaxy, you see much the same thing we see. So we have a glance at the universe that we have good evidence is what you would see in other, any other galaxy. And uh, so things are pretty simple. We see what anyone else would see. Great. Uh, next question from Jordan, um, another student. Thank you to all the students who are joining us today, I have to say, and for asking these great questions. Very so Jordan's, Jordan's question is, what advice would you give uh, to high school students thinking of going into science as a career? Again, I would say, look around you. Try to decide what really interests you, but don't fix on it too strongly unless you're very sure. As I said before, the world is a wonderful place. All sorts of things to consider, from cosmology to sociology, to the behavior of people, to the behavior of the cells and people, an endless list of things to investigate. You'll want to choose one eventually, but don't choose too quickly. Look around you, see what what is to your taste, and look into it, and then look around some more. Great. Uh, next question from Ben Guest. What are your thoughts on the discrepancy in the different measurement methods of the Hubble constant? Yes. A fascinating business. When I invented the standard cosmology in two papers, 1982 and 1984, I was just putting together a theory that would account for the measurements we had then. Without the postulate of non baryonic dark matter, things just didn't fit together, so I introduced it. I built the simplest theory I could get away with that fit the observations we had then. I didn't expect it would be the ultimate reality. It certainly isn't the ultimate reality. It was a good approximation. I would, ex I would certainly expect that the simple approximations would have to be corrected, at least in part. That's been so. Several corrections have been introduced since then. Perhaps the latest correction will be to take account of this discrepancy in the expansion rate deduced in two different ways. Uh, I'm of two minds about that discrepancy, and I think most of the community is. On the one hand, I say to myself, wow, the present theory has worked so well so far. Surely, surely that anomaly is just a systematic error. But at the same time, I'm hoping that, system, that anomaly is real. Because if it's real, it's a hint to a still better theory. I think the evidence in favor of the present theory is so strong that it's not likely to be abandoned. Instead, it will be adjusted. Lots of papers on how the theory might be adjusted. I'm hoping the anomaly is real, so, one of the, so it will be a guide to a better theory. I'm hoping that other anomalies will arise. The more anomalies, the better the guide to a better theory. But we will see. Next question from Claude. How can we operate a marriage of the theory of relativity and quantum physics, bearing in mind that Einstein theory was based years ago on skimpy evidences? Absolutely, although I would emphasize the present evidence for Einstein's theory is really quite compelling. But you make a definitely excellent point. Um, quantum mechanics does not fit at all easily into our ideas about the evolving universe. The main problem is simple. In quantum physics, there is zero point energy. We know that energy is real. You get the wrong binding energies if you don't count, take account of the zero point energy. Quantum mechanics applies to atoms and molecules. It applies equally well to the radiation field. Surely then the zero point energies of the radiation field are as real as those of molecules. 
And yet, if you add up the zero point energies of the electromagnetic field over uh, laboratory wavelengths, you get a ridiculous mass density, which is absurdly large. Wolfgang Pauli in the 1930s knew that. It's really remarkable that in his beautiful handbook, the physique article on quantum mechanics, he admitted that apparently the zero point energy of the electromagnetic field is not real. How could he say that? He understood perfectly well that it's the same quantum mechanics as giving us uh, successful descriptions of atomic physics as well as electromagnetism. But he couldn't see what else to do. We still don't. It's just a horrible anomaly. Now, um, what do we make of it? I might just mention that there is one idea, uh, the so-called anthropic argument. Maybe, maybe there are many universes, enormous numbers. Maybe each universe has its own laws of physics and its own value of the cosmological constant, which is to say the zero point energies of all the fields summed up. We wouldn't be in a universe with an immense mass density in zero point energies. Uh, the universe would either collapse far too soon or expand far too rapidly. Surely we'll be in a universe that uh, allows us to exist and such a universe would, through some happenstance or another, have a reasonable value of the vacuum energy density. I don't like that argument because it, it has the flavor of a just so story, how the leopard got its spot, how the cosmological constant got its value. But uh, I have to admit, we have a deep problem uh, worth a Nobel Prize to solve, find a nice connection between quantum physics and cosmology. Okay. Uh Next, it's a comment from Hodor. I'm a professor at U of M. I listened to your press conference after winning the Nobel Prize. I was touched by your loyalty to U of M. Thank you. We all share the same uh, appreciation of uh, your comments about U of M. We really thank you for that. Uh, next uh, is a question from Sam. Do you think scientific recognition system like Nobel Prize to individuals instead of teams limits cooperation between scientists and the exchange of ideas? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, b b b I should make a remark about such things as a Nobel Prize. I, with a false modesty, believe I deserve that prize. But you have to bear in mind that the awarding of these prizes is exceedingly complicated. So many eventualities have to line up in order for you to be considered for a major prize or award. It happens, but I can name many examples where it should have happened but didn't, just because there are so many possibilities to consider, so many eventualities get in the way. So my, I strongly urge uh, if you are beginning a career in science, don't judge your career by prizes and awards. They'll come or they won't, but that's an eventuality. Now, as for the question you asked, which is a really good one, do these the Nobel Prize can be awarded to at most three people. Uh, many scientific endeavors, well, I mentioned the latest satellite measurements of the radiation background, a thousand people. How do you... How do you reconcile those two practices? Um, I think the Nobel people are quite aware of this problem, as are other major awards. They're trying to decide what to do. Um, some are moving more rapidly. The Nobel Prize, you know, has such a heavy tradition. They've got to move slowly. Um, a remedy has got to be found. I, I think the remedy is easy, and I've been pushing it. Uh, you may name the experiment and you, you may assign um, you may assign a particular person as a spokesperson for that experiment, but you don't award it to a single individual when so many contributed to the success of the experiment. Okay, um, so I have we have never been in a large group, so there was never a problem with me. Mm. Uh, 
Um, so we have actually reached our time limit. However, there are lots of questions. Many are really good questions. So if you don't mind, Jim, if we can go another just five minutes, because people really want to have more of you. <laughs> I like and, the questions. Uh, and, you know, people who are uh, looking at the questions, you can vote. And the most popular questions will rise to the top. So I'm going to try to cover as many as possible in the next five questions, uh, next five yeah. minutes. Uh, the next question, do you have a particular favorite formulation of foundational quantum mechanics, such as Ho Copenhagen or many worlds? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, I wrote a textbook on quantum mechanics. I've taught it many times, undergraduate and graduate. I really love the subject. The measurements problem is subtle, more subtle than usually credited. You may remember Schrodinger's cat. The cat is placed in a cage. A, a, a Geiger counter is placed near it. When the Geiger counter registers a decay of an atomic nucleus, it pulls the trigger of a gun and the poor old cat is dead. Well, you have to live with the uh, mixed states where the cat is both alive and dead. That doesn't happen in practice. The cat is in such a tightly complicated mixed state with you and me and the rest of the world that we live very different lives from an atom or even, or even a, a virus molecule. They can be placed in two states, but not us. So I don't feel at all uncomfortable with the standard Copenhagen interpretation. The, Quantum mechanics is a wonderfully good approximation, but applied to you and me, it's just a lousy approximation. What can I say? Good, thank you. Next question, what parts should unobservable parts of the universe play in cosmological models? How would these models be evaluated accounting for non-falsifiable predictions? Well, uh, let me see about, um, if we talk about multiverses, then there is a host of universes that we can, in principle, never visit. Uh, I, I don't get very excited about such a notion. In our universe, there are certainly components that we're very convinced are there through their gravity, but we haven't yet detected the dark matter. We, the, there are wonderful experiments in progress in detecting this dark matter, either directly in the laboratory indirectly by astronomical observations. They haven't succeeded. Any day now, we may hear the wonderful news, detection of the dark matter. But maybe it only interacts with gravity and nothing else. So there would be, uh, I think, the theory stands without detection of the dark matter. The evidence is strong. Um, that, of course, is not matter that's quite unobservable because it has a gravitational effect. I'm not sure if that answered the question. All right, that's good. Uh, next question from Jesse. How did Dickey and your research group as a whole react to Penzies and Wilson being awarded the Nobel Prize for their cosmic microwave background discovery? Well, life is complicated, isn't it? Um, Bell Labs engineers had an anomaly. Penzias and Wilson are to be credited, credited for refusing to give up on trying to find the source of that anomaly. Therefore, and they are to be credited also for refusing to give up and instead complaining about it until someone heard. That directed them to Bob Dickey, who had directed his own search for that radiation. It was quite appropriate to award the Nobel Prize to Arnold Penzias and Bob Wilson. I was dumbfounded that the third person allowed by the terms of the, of the prize wasn't Bob Dickey. Why they did that is beyond me. I have taken the Nobel people to chart to, to task for that. I just can't, I still cannot quite fathom why they didn't do that. But you know, Bob Dickey had a healthy, good life. He had other prizes and awards. It's fine. It's fine, except it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. A question from Tim. What do you think dark matter is? 
I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Another Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's curious how Nobel Prizes are awarded, of course. There were two lines of evidence for the presence of, uh, of the cosmological constant. One reaped great rewards, including the Nobel Prize. The other, deduced through the NSF to be in the microwave background radiation, received none. Again, it's capricious. All right, next question from Omar. Hello, do you think that computer science is shifting how we view and learn physics, possibly new physics? Was it said possibly? New physics? Possibly new physics. Well, you know, I, 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 there is a danger of forgetting old good physics. Um, I feel uneasy about seeing young people do very elaborate numerical computations. And they're beautiful experiments, and far beyond whatever I tried. Beautiful, beautiful images resulting. Uh, it's got to be right. But um, a lack of pausing and thinking about the physics underlying the numerics is sometimes makes me uneasy. Will we discover new physics through computation? Sure, it could happen. Uh, sifting through vast amounts of data can reveal all sorts of things. I feel uneasy, though. You should pause and consider that when you sift through tons of evidence, you can only be superficial. I have to insist. You can help just take, take, look at a few bits of evidence and examine them with care. Both styles are important. And sure, from the vast um, computer operation, something new may show up. You've got to try it. All right. Um... Would you like to go further or should oh, we stop? Another few. Another few. Another few. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, I can go forever. I don't mind, but I want to <laughs> make sure. <laughs> um, so the next question is from Kyle. Since physics is about ideas and there are clearly good and bad ideas, yes. how do you think ideas should be nurtured with bad ideas minimized? Well, it gets complicated, doesn't it? Because, for example, Einstein thought the cosmological constant is a bad idea. Many agreed with him. And yet, uh, the evidence forced it on us. It's very difficult. Uh, of just a few cautionary remarks. If you, have, if you are a teacher and you have an idea that's unorthodox, by all means, pursue it but don't encourage your students to pursue it unless they really insist because new ideas are often wrong. If you're a tenured faculty member, fine. Doesn't matter if you're wrong once or twice, but it can hurt the career of a young person you're teaching if you guide them to an idea that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So again, it's part of the game. You, you should consider new ideas. You must, as they say, think outside the box. Uh, but uh, be careful. And um, in my career, I have thought of un un unorthodox ideas, and I've worked on orthodox ideas. Some of the orthodox I ideas failed, and some of the unorthodox ones worked. Good to keep a balance. But uh, no, um, it's difficult to deal with unorthodox ideas. Um, got to be careful with them, and you got to be aware that some of them are really nutty. Okay, next next question from Jayanne. Hi, Jim. Wonderful topic. Any ideas about why there are simultaneous inventions? Jayanne, is that, is that you? Yes. No, yes. good for you. That must be our JM. <laughs> yes, uh, I met her several, quite a few years ago while visiting Winnipeg. Um, how do we account for the multiples in discovery? We talk to each other. We communicate with each other by many means. And I think these notions have got to circulate, not expressly, stated, but rather hinted at by our behavior. I think it has to be. And of course, we all have the same input uh, in the sense of what's happening in the laboratory, in the papers presented, in arguments at colloquia, 
in informal remarks over coffee at the at meetings. We communicate, I think, in many ways that aren't explicit. And I think that communication has got to play a role in causing these multiples. Great. Is there anything beyond our expanding universe? Well, we, we won't know if we can't look and see. Uh, wonderful to speculate about ideas about what's beyond what we can see, beyond the horizon. Sounds romantic. It is romantic. It is, though, a long shot. Um, so I guess along with my ever-increasing respect for phenomenology is my ever-increasing distrust in ideas that can't be tested. I say again, I just am so deeply impressed by the fertile interaction of theory and experiment and deeply impressed by the vacuity I see in pure theory. Next question. What do you think of string theory? Do you think that some other such interpretations would be more accurate? Oh, no? wait, wait, twin theory. Did you say? String, string oh, theory. String, string theory. Yeah. Magnificent theory, magnificent. It even has practical applications in high energy collisions where particles are effectively massless. Beautiful mathematics, I'm told. Um, you know, that theory has been with us since the 80s. And um, beautiful mathematics has resulted, but I haven't heard of any substantial contributions to the physics from that string theory. Yes, by all means, continue working on it, but um, I'm not holding my breath for results. Soon. All right. Uh, do you believe that life, intelligent life, exists elsewhere in the universe? Well, belief is a difficult word. Um, you know the numbers. Astronomers are now pretty sure that there are as many planets around stars as there are stars. In our galaxy, there are some tens of thousands of millions of stars similar to ours. Think of that vast number of planets. All kinds of things are happening on the surface of those planets. Immense possibilities. Life? Well, well, who knows? And you know, the, the, the tantalizing thing is the nearest planet in another solar system that um, is so placed that water on its surface would neither boil nor freeze is just four light years away. It's not totally out of the question that we could send a fleet of robots to that planet, take photographs. It would only take three light years, three years for the photographs to be sent back to us. Take quite a lot longer for the robots to get there, but wouldn't you love to see what's on the surface of that planet? Next question or comment from Barry Panas. A uh, Winnipeg High School physics teacher here. Oh. Thank you very much for your time. You are very inspirational for our next generation of physicists. Thank you. And thank you, Barry, for joining us today. Uh, next question from Janet Swirly. Other than the fundamental differences, what do you think prevented more research collaborations between physicists and social scientists? Ha. Huh. I mentioned the science wars. I was, I was hurt, hurt when, when I found it su suggested that I'd been making up theories. Of course, it's much more subtle than that. Um, I, know, I, I have talked to sociologists. They, they understand things. They understand things that I don't. The, um, the arguments though, that uh, we may have made up much of our science, um, well, it doesn't hold water. They are quite right to say that in the 50s, in, in the 60s, um, we were pushing science that was not tested. Uh, we should have emphasized more clearly that that's the case. We had a happy ending in that case. But, um, well, should sociologists and sciences, and <clears throat> let me start again, should 
sociologists and physicists work together. Uh, I am talking to a sociologist in our university. We're not working together. She's educating me on what sociologists are thinking about physics. I don't see the room really for collaboration, but rather for mutual instruction. If they started doing physics, they wouldn't be sociologists, I guess. Right. Okay, I'll ask the very last question um, from John. Did you ever consider another career after starting in cosmology? Well, no, no. Um, I was so busy doing cosmology. I do find many other things fascinating. I like gardening. I guess I could be a gardener of some sort. I love, <clears throat> I love the woods, the forests. I love archeology. span I'm not so strong on, on beetles, but I guess I could stand them. Um, yeah, there were possibilities. I, I could have gone in other directions, but life treated me very well. I just got totally captured by cosmology and kept going after it. Persistence, thank you so much. So um, I'm sorry, everyone, we won't be able to ask all these remaining questions and if we keep going more questions will keep coming <laughs> we can't have enough of you jim so thank you so much for going over time we made an exception here we were hoping to have you in person but that didn't work out hopefully yeah. later uh so thank you so much for your uh, very inspirational talk and for your generous time and thank you everyone for all your excellent questions and for being uh, so engaged uh, and making the time today to join us. Um, so the next talk, uh, yeah, yeah say, Jim, you want to say something? Enjoyed this. Yes, yeah. We'll have you again, <laughs> if you don't mind. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so clapping, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and uh, now we move to just advertising our next speaker. Our next talk uh, is by Dr. Max Turgeon, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Manitoba. And he's gonna talk about how to see in 100 dimensions, transforming your data to better uh, understand it. So we hope to see many of you next uh, Friday. I should also remind everyone that these talks are uh, available for viewing at a later time. So feel free to spread the world and have anyone interested uh, have a look. They are posted on the Faculty of Science uh, YouTube channel. With that, we end today's session. Thank you everyone for your participation. I wish you a wonderful weekend and hope to see you again next Friday. Thank you. and. Bye, Jim. Thanks a lot. Take care.